Okay, so uh, at the end of last class, we were just uh, about halfway through the first canto. So we need to pick that up. <clears throat> we had just uh, talked about the way in which Dante the Pilgrim, you'll hear me say Dante the Pilgrim, Dante the Narrator, Dante the uh, Traveler, Dante the Voyager. Somebody used that term. I don't think that's quite right. Voyager. Voyage is something usually takes in a ship. But uh, in any case, uh, we need to make a distinction between Dante the poet and Dante the fictional character that makes the journey through the three realms of the afterlife. So sometimes I'll, forgot, I'll forget to say that, and sometimes in your papers you'll forget to say that, and I'll say Dante the narrator, Dante the pilgrim. Try to keep those uh, two... Dante's uh, distinguished. And there's even a third Dante we can talk about, but I won't bring that up now. We'll talk about that a little later. So uh, Dante the Pilgrim has just uh, found himself in the dark wood, and uh, he spends a terrible night uh, lost in the wood. Then he sees the sunrise over a hill, and uh, he wants to climb the hill. And then he is blocked by three different animals. And so this is... Uh, page 31 of the text, uh, the first canto, a leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf. Now, those three animals obviously have symbolic or allegorical significance. Every critic has his own opinion as to what they might signify. A traditional interpretation, a specific interpretation, is to see the leopard as the sin of lust, the lion as the sin of pride, and the she-wolf as the sin of avarice, three of the uh, seven deadly sins. I kind of like the interpretation that sees a connection between these three animals and the three sections of hell that Dante describes that he has to journey through. The first section is what uh, modern uh, scholars call the sins of incontinence. The sins of incontinence. The second section, the sins of violence. And the third section, the sins of fraud. So we'll talk more about the organization of the Inferno later in the class, but just as a kind of uh, preview here, you can see the three animals as being a kind of forecast of the three main areas of the Inferno that Dante will travel through. Sins of incontinence are sins of natural human instinct carried to excess. Glutton, eating too much, drinking too much. Uh, lust, excessive sexual activity. And the sins of violence are sins like murder or theft. And sins of fraud are sins that require the use of the reason, use of human intelligence. And so, you know, oddly enough, Dante considers, uh, would probably consider, you know, the uh, Wall Street uh, hedge fund guys that brought about the economic crisis worse sinners than a murderer. Because for Dante, you know, a murder committed in passion, that's a very serious crime, but it's even worse to use your brain to try to deceive someone, to gain advantage through fraud. That's what fraud means, to deceive someone for your personal advantage. So, I guess the other thing to say is the una lupa, you know, uh, I think I said in the class last time, most of you are women, it seems like all my classes, ever since I've been an English teacher, all my classes have had more women than men, and, uh, you know, the she-wolf really rankles, and I'm afraid it is a she-wolf because there is a masculine form, a masculine wolf is called un lupo, and this is una lupa. So you can't, you know, fudge it. It's definitely a female uh, animal. And she's the worst, right? She's the one that drives Dante back down the hill until he abandons hope. This is where we were at the end of class. Line 53 uh, or 4 there. The very sight of her so weighted me with fearfulness that I abandoned hope of ever climbing up the mountain slope. And then we get a simile. Remember, an epic simile is a simile, a comparison, using like or as, a specific, specifically explicit comparison, uh, but which is extended. 
not just my love is like a rose, but my love is like a rose that grows in a garden and the rain comes and the snow comes and blah, blah, blah. an extended simile. Even as he, there's the as, who glories while uh, he gains, will when the time has come to tally loss, lament with every thought and turn despondent, so was I when I faced the restless beast, which even as she stalked me step by step, had thrust me back to where the sun is speechless. So the comparison here is to gambling, right? And while you're winning, it's great. But then when you begin losing and you have to recognize that you've lost all your money, it's terrible. And the effectiveness of the simile lies in the fact that Dante had thought that he was on his way to whatever it is at the top of the mountain. He thought he could climb the mountain. He got out of the wood. And that makes it that much more depressing if you've had a bit of success when then again you're thrown back into your old situation. Now, I always think it's a very common situation of an illness. You know, you've got some horrible thing, horrible flu. It goes on for months. Finally, you think you're over it. You get really happy and then, oh, I've got it again. Come, you know, the relapse, the relapse of an illness, something like that. It's so much worse after you've had some success and think that you've overcome a problem to have the problem come back. While I retreated down to lower ground, retreated there, the Italian says rovinava. You can see the word ruin there, ruin, while I ruined back. You know, it's a much, uh, retreated sounds like a very careful and purposeful retreat. No, it's being thrown back, right? Being thrown back and down. While I retreated down to lower ground before my eyes, there suddenly appeared one who seemed faint because of the long silence. So, as I said last time, this is Dante's, the nadir, the low point of Dante's journey, right? And just at this point, divine grace intervenes. God helps Dante. And how does he help him? By sending Virgil. By sending Virgil to help him. So, just at this point, before my eyes, there suddenly appeared one who seemed faint because of the long silence. Well, we know now, I mean, I'm giving away the mystery here, but I know you know. This is Virgil. So why would Virgil be called faint because of long silence? Well, he's been dead for a long time, right? I mean, even in Dante's time, he was dead for a thousand years. So he hasn't spoken to a living being in uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. So he's faint that way. But also maybe symbolically or allegorically, if Virgil represents, as one traditional interpretation has it, reason, or even if he represents something as general as human nature at its best, or conscience, whatever he represents, Dante hasn't been listening to him. That's how he's gotten in the dark wood in the first place. So he's faint in the sense that Dante has not been paying attention to this aspect of his personality. When I saw him in that vast wilderness, have pity on me, were the words I cried. Whatever you may be, a shade, a man. Well, if you look over at the Italian, miserere di me. Now, for those of you who are studying classics, it's a deponent verb. It's the imperative form of misereor. Misereor, miserere di me, have mercy on me. Whatever you may be, a shade, a man. So Dante's not sure if Virgil is a living being or if he's just a ghost, if he's just a spirit. He answered me, not man, I once was man. Both of my parents came from Lombardy and both claimed Mantua as native city. And I was born, though late, Sub Iulio, and I lived in Rome under the good Augustus in the season of the false and lying gods. If you read the Aeneid, you know that Virgil's greatest virtue is pietas, you know, piety, filial piety, respect for one's parents, 
also respect for one's nation and respect for the gods. And so when you find Virgil identifying himself in this passage, he doesn't say, as we might expect him to say, I'm Virgil, the great poet. What he says is, both of my parents came from Lombardy, right? He identifies himself by reference to his family and then to the city in which he lives, sort of like nation today. Both claim Mantua as native city. And then to the country. And I was born, though late, sub Julio, under the reign of Julius Caesar, and lived in Rome under the good Augustus. The season of the false and lying gods. Now, from the very beginning, as soon as Virgil introduces himself, no matter how much we admire him, no matter how much he represents qualities that Dante admired, he immediately points out his great weakness. He was born before the time of Christ, in the season of the false and lying gods. St. Augustine and other Christian writers had decided that the pagan gods, like Jupiter and Venus and um, Neptune and so forth, were actually devils in disguise who tempted people to worship them to deceive them into worshiping. A really strange idea. But that's why he calls them false and lying gods. The season there just means uh, nel tempo, in the time of the false and lying gods. I was a poet. Well, that's probably why Dante chooses Virgil rather than Aristotle, for example, would make a good guide if he wanted a really wise non-Christian guide, and if you wanted a Christian guide, maybe St. Augustine, or maybe St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, a lot of the theology of the poem is based on Thomas. No, he wanted a poet. I was a poet, and I sang the righteous son of Anchises, who had come from Troy when flames destroyed the pride of Ilium. Well, this is a circumlocution, right? He doesn't say his name, but he gives us enough information so that if you're reasonably well-educated, you know who he is, because you know who sang. Well, first of all, you've got to know who Anchises was. Anchises was the father of Aeneas, right? So the son of Anchises was Aeneas, who came from Troy when flames destroyed the pride of Ilium. But notice, it's not just the son of Anchises, it's the righteous son of Anchises. For Dante, Virgil's Aeneas was a kind of exemplar of human behavior. And what I'll be arguing later is that what Dante admires in Virgil is classical civilization and the highest ideals of classical civilization. And those ideals for Dante are embodied in the character of Aeneas, the great hero of the Roman Empire. But why do you return to wretchedness? Why not climb up the mountain of delight, the origin and cause of every joy? So Virgil, as a non-Christian, here he sees this Christian who has the opportunity to get to heaven, and he's naturally frustrated. You know, what are you doing? Why don't you, you know, why are you losing hope? And this, it seems to me, the next part now is one of the most psychologically a realistic and moving parts of the whole poem, Dante doesn't answer the question, right? He says, why don't you climb the mountain? And Dante says, are you then that Virgil? You, the fountain that freely pours so rich a stream of speech? I answered him with shame upon my brow. Why does he have shame on his brow? Well, because Virgil's caught him in such an awkward situation, lost in the dark wood in the midst of sin and error, right? Oh, light and honor of all other poets, may my long study and the intense love that made me search your volume serve me now. You are my master and my author. You the only one from whom my writing drew the noble style for which I have been honored. So Dante's first reaction is not to answer Virgil's question, but to just say, wow, Virgil! You know, uh, you know what, if, what if Chun Lin could meet Chaucer? You know, he wouldn't be worried about his own problems. He'd be saying, wow, Jeffrey, you know, what a chance to talk to Chaucer himself. 
Virgil was for Dante the poet, just like Aristotle was the philosopher, right? So it's like having Yao Ming come to dinner, you know, you're just, wow, you know, you're overwhelmed by the surprise and the delight of meeting this person. Notice how he says, you are my master and my author. Well, the Italian word autore is related to the Latin word that means authority, and an author is too. So there's a kind of a pun there. You're my author. You're the writer that I love and have studied, but also you are an authority. You are a person whose ideas and whose behavior, whose um, moral conduct I take as an authority. You are my master and my author. You see the beast. That made me turn aside. Help me, O famous sage, famoso saggio. Virgil, not only a poet, but also a wise person, a sage. Right. Oh, help me, famous sage, to stand against her, for she has made my blood and pulses shudder. It is another path that you must take, he answered, when he saw my tearfulness. If you would leave this savage wilderness... The beast that is the cause of your outcry allows no man to pass along her track. Her nature is so squalid, filthy, so malicious, that she can never sate her greedy will. When she is fed, she's hungrier than ever. She mates with many living souls and shall yet mate with many more until the greyhound arrives, inflicting painful death on her. So Virgil seems to know about the she-wolf, and he seems to know what she represents, at least in a general way. And he even knows that there's going to be a solution to the evil that she represents. And the solution is going to be a greyhound, whatever that possibly can mean. And again, you get a situation where even more than the three beasts, there's just no consensus on what this greyhound could be. Some critics say, well, one of uh, Dante's most important patrons, the person who gave him lodging and support, was called Can Grande della Scala. Well, that means big dog. So maybe, maybe that's who he hopes will become the salvation of Italy, Can Grande della Scala. Maybe it's Henry VII. We'll talk more about that later, but Henry VII was a Holy Roman Emperor, a young emperor that Dante put a lot of hope in. He came into Italy, he began to try to put the affairs of Italy in order, but he died unexpectedly at a young age, and so Dante's hopes were, were dashed for Henry VII. Maybe it means Christ himself, right? Because, of course, you know, Christ has died, and Christ will rise again. Christ will come again. The second coming of Christ, right? The second coming of Christ. You're familiar with that from Yeats's poem with that title. So the idea is that Christ has died, uh, Christ is re resurrected, and Christ will come again. He will come again to create peace in the world. At the last judgment, society will be reformed. All the evil people will be punished. All the good people will be rewarded and there will be a kind of perfect society. Many religions have this idea. If you know the Arthurian legend, Arthur is the once and future king. Rex quondam atque futurus, the old king and the new king. The idea is the legend is he will come back and rule England once again, Arthur, King Arthur, and he will correct all the political problems of England. The Germans have a similar legend about the uh, Emperor Barbarossa, who will come back and unify Germany. You know. The Chinese, or at least the Buddhists, you know, Milofo, will be the Buddha that comes back and, uh, and sort of uh, straightens things out. So it's a very common motif, and nobody really knows what this greyhound... I was just... Uh, there was a Dante scholar here last uh, term who gave a lecture on Paradiso, I, I attended it, we were talking. 
he thinks the Greyhound is the comedy itself. The poem itself will be the way in which the she-wolf is defeated through the teachings, through the moral teachings of the comedy itself. This uh, amelioration of society will be brought about. That hound, we get a little more detail now about the greyhound, will never feed on land or pewter, but find his fare in wisdom, love, and virtue. His place of birth shall be between two felts. You <laughs> know, what the heck? Two felts. Now, this Dante scholar, he says, well, it could be the binding of a book, the covers of a book covered with felt. But unfortunately, he hasn't found any evidence that books were ever covered with felt. Uh, in any case, uh, between two felts. He will restore low-lying Italy, for which the maid Camilla died of wounds, and Nisus, Turnus, and Euryalus. So now we get some specific names from the Aeneid. Camilla fought on the Italian side. Turnus was the head of the native Italian forces that Aeneas had to fight with when he got to Italy. Nisus and Euryalus were two Trojan warriors who died tragically during the battle in Italy. And he will hunt that beast through every city until he thrusts her back again to hell from which she was first sent above by envy. So whatever the greyhound was, it first came out of hell and into the world through envy, probably referring to the envy of Satan for the power of God, right? There's a passage in the Old Testament. By the envy of the devil, death entered the world. Maybe that's what Dante's thinking of. Now Virgil goes on, Therefore I think and judge it best for you to follow me, and I shall guide you, taking you from this place through an eternal place. So Virgil is the guide. I think and judge. That's redundant, right? sort of repetitious, I think, and I judge. But maybe what Dante is doing there is reinforcing the idea that whatever Virgil represents, he represents a power of the intellect. Reason, conscience, I think, I judge. It's best for you to follow me and I shall guide you. I shall take you through this place, through an eternal place, where you shall hear the howls of desperation and see the ancient spirits in their pain. That, of course, is hell as each of them laments his second death. The first death is the death of the body. The second death, the death of the soul. And you shall see those souls who are content within the fire, for they hope to reach, whenever that may be, the blessed people. So the souls that are content within the fire are the souls on the mountain of purgatory, who are being purified of their sins. And, of course, the blessed people are the souls in heaven. If you would then ascend as high as these, meaning the blessed people, a soul more worthy than I am will guide you. I'll leave you in her care when I depart. Because that emperor who reigns above, since I have been rebellious to his law, will not allow me entry to his city. So there's going to be a woman involved here. We don't know who she is at this point. But it makes up a little bit for the she-wolf. The she-wolf is the one that drives Dante down, and there's going to be a woman who is going to guide him to heaven. Virgil can't guide Dante the entire journey. Why? Because he says, I have been rebellious to God's law, and he will not allow me entry to his city. Well, he's being too hard on himself there. He really hasn't been rebellious to God's law. He didn't know God's law. And Dante corrects him in the passage that immediately follows here. But notice, it will not allow me entry to his city. He governs everywhere, but rules from there. I just had a student ask me, you know, why is Satan at the middle of the earth? Uh, you know, if, if this is the diagram, there's hell, there's the middle of the earth, here's purgatory. Wouldn't this be closer to heaven? Well, no, because the idea is the material universe is a sphere and beyond the sphere is where you find the, the realm of the spirit. I mean, it's sort of awkward to talk about space uh, when you're talking about God is everywhere, right? But uh, that's why Virgil says, you know, uh, he governs everywhere, but rules from there. 
but is imagined to be beyond the material world. So the, the realm of God is seen as a city, as a society, as a community. I think that's important because when you look back at the Aeneid, the whole Aeneid is about the foundation of a city, right? the foundation of Rome. And so the way in which the Romans considered and the Greeks considered their most perfect, happy situation would be living in a city. You know, kiwis. That's the word for citizen. And that's the origin of the word civilization. Everything civilization means, everything that's good about a civilization, living in a city. It's not the kind of afterlife that you think of when you think of, say, nirvana, you know, sort of going into a state of a kind of isolated spiritual enlightenment. There's a, a society involved in the afterlife. So that emperor who reigns above, since I have been rebellious to his law, will not allow me entry to his city. He governs everywhere but rules from there. There is his city, his high capital. Oh, happy those he chooses to be there. That's from the office of the mass. Happy are those who are called to this table. You know, it's what the priest says when he calls the people to come up and take the consecrated wafer, come up and take communion. So there's a nostalgia there. Uh, you know, uh, poor Virgil, right? He really is excluded. And I replied, O oh, poet, by that God whom you had never come to know. Notice how Dante very, very charitably sets the record straight. It's not that Virgil was rebellious to God, it's just that he never knew about the Christian God. I beg you that I may flee this evil and worse evils to lead me to the place of which you speak, that I may see the gateway of St. Peter and those whom you describe as sorrowful. Then he set out, and I moved on behind him. So the gateway of St. Peter is the gateway to heaven. Traditional iconography shows St. Peter as the guardian of the gate that leads to heaven. St. Peter was Christ's most favorite disciple and the one whom he chose to found his church. 